So the mayor talked about community transformation. And this afternoon, I've got the privilege to be in conversation for probably about 20 minutes um, with a leader that is deeply rooted in this city and is deeply engaged in trying to make sure that the city works for everyone. Eddie Bocanegra, Senior Director of the Ready Program at the Heartland Alliance. <laughs> and what we want to do as we start this conversation is actually start from where his work, there's an intersection of his work with trauma and community violence. So what I want to do is let Eddie tell you a little bit about his work, what makes it unique, and then we'll dive deeper into the conversation. Does that work for you? Sure, Mark Thank you. So Ready Chicago came as a result of 2016 spike in violence in our city, where we saw over 750 homicides. Uh, unpresidentially, you know, we haven't seen those numbers since the early 1990s. Um, and what ended up coming out of that, out of that spike in violence was foundations and other people coming together, the nonprofits, government, to think about what is our investment, what is our approach to addressing this issue. And ultimately, born was Ready Chicago, mm -hmm. which is in partnership with the University of Chicago's Crime Lab. Ultimately, the program is designed to focus with individuals who are at the highest risk of gun involvement, which means that these are individuals uh, who are more likely to be shot or end up shooting somebody, and to really saturate them with resources, specifically with finding with um, subsidized employment opportunities, but also 18 months of kind of behavior therapy plus an additional six months of ongoing support. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because, like, my perspective, Mike, was really informed by different entry, uh, points. So first, at a young age, I was exposed to domestic violence at home. Secondly, when I was 13 years old, witnessing my first homicide. Uh, and for those who might not know, so I grew up uh, in the southwest side of Chicago. The mayor just pointed out uh, the disinvestments uh, and the mar marginalizations that many communities that exist here in Chicago. Well, Little Village happens to be one of them. Mm -hmm. But my perspective was also informed by the fact that by the time I was 14 years old, I was involved in a street gang. By the time I was 17, uh, a friend of mine, Gabriel, died in the backseat of my car. And then by the time I was 18, I was in front of a judge um, facing a first-degree gang-related murder, to which I ended up serving 14 years and three months. But my perspective is also informed by my education, you know, master's degree at the University of Chicago, and I've been executive director. I've also done a lot of community organizing, policy work, research through Columbia and Michigan, all those great things that has really given me this opportunity to really kind of understand the intersections of violence prevention, but also the criminal justice work. And so when I think about my lived experience and when I think about the perspective that I learned through the, uh, the criminal justice system, I learned that most people who are incarcerated have been victims of violence, but our society, for whatever reason or another, the minute that they actually create an offense, break the law, we forget that they were victims of violence. They were victims to begin with, and we only focus on the fact that they made a mistake. Gotcha. Thank you. You consider Ready a program? I consider it more like an initiative simply okay. because uh, we are providing direct service right now through seven amazing partners. Uh, but the truth is that what Ready Chicago uh, has actually done in the space mm -hmm. is really disrupt the way that we've done business. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? I mean that for 50, 60 years, street outreach has looked a specific way. It's, it's engaging people in the community. It's really uh, disrupting the potential uh, possibility of somebody shooting at each other. Uh, and that is critical. Mm -hmm. But it's, to some extent, it needed to be injected with other services. So the fact that you, now you have outreach workers providing a job, for example, and you have outreach workers that are being trained to deliver kind of behavior therapy, and you're bringing in the workforce component to this picture. Mm -hmm. We're addressing some immediate needs for our folks, which is in many cases employment, bringing in money to the community, bringing in money to their households. Uh, that's critical. But the other part, Michael, at the end of the day, it's like we could address all those symptoms, mm -hmm. but we really got to get to the root causes. Now, I know that hopefully we have a chance to talk more about what are those root causes. Mm -hmm. But one example that I could give you right now is that through therapy, through mm -hmm. kind of behavior therapy, CBT, it's one way that we could really not only invest in the people who are coming from the community and train and develop them to provide that service, mm -hmm. but also the 580 men that are in British Chicago right now have begun the process of better understanding uh, their philosophies of how they process trauma mm -hmm. and how they navigate um, hostile situations as well. So we're equipping them with the right tools to address that. Let's stay on the point around some of the structural stuff. 
what else needs to happen to support the amazing group of nonprofit leaders out there that are doing really great programmatic work in the context of this initiative? Yeah. What needs to happen to fully realize the vision of the mayor's um, call, which was to create community transformation? You know, one of the things that I've seen, Michael, in the last three years or so, as a result of, of philanthropy and government coming together, uh, is that historically, in my short career, I have seen so many of the nonprofits kind of competing with each other, constantly chasing the money, uh, what I would call even organizational game banging at, at the community level. Uh, here I am, I'm, I, was, I was in undergraduate school, and I'm, and I'm talking to my professor, Frank Aitan, and I'm like, hey, all this time that I was in prison, I was really trying to aspire to be a professional, but I'm learning that being a professional means that you're kind of game banging at a different level now. <laughs> and so, so I learned that early on, uh -huh. and so it was kind of a shocker for me. But I also realized that it's not only in the nonprofit sector, it's in government as well, mm -hmm. it's in other, in other spaces. And so I think as a result of what happened in 2016, it really brought so many people together uh, for one common cause, and it's how do we tackle this issue of violence prevention? whether it's focusing on the gun policy issues, whether it's focusing on the Chicago Police Department, or whether it's focusing on direct service. All of that is extremely important, including the policy. And so I think right now there's a huge opportunity in our city to really tackle some of the things that the mayor just, just raised just a minute ago. But one last thing that I'll mention as it relates to your question, we also have to be very cognizant that a lot of our nonprofits are very small in size, two to five million for the most part. And so when they're in the community and they see the needs, what happens a lot of times, they spread themselves very thin. Mm -hmm. And they have a hard time providing high quality service on a specific issue that they're trying to tackle. And so I, I would encourage us to think about, well, what do we need to do to strengthen some of those nonprofits? And for the large ones, like Heart and Alliance, which is one of the largest nonprofits in our state, how do we leverage all the 130 years of expertise and continue to, like, bring that into the community so that we could train and develop others as well. And at the same time, we're also learning through that process. And I would say Ready Chicago has been one example of how we've been able to do some of that work. Do you really believe what you just said? I really do, honestly. Let Listen, I, Michael, I'm going to be really honest with you. Like, <laughs> let me ask you, let me tell you why I say that. We were talking earlier about the design of oppression. Yep. We could do a lot of leveraging and raising the capacity of nonprofits, right? But if the design of oppression doesn't change, should we stop putting this narrative on if we just did some tweaks to the nonprofit sector that somehow the outcomes will be different? You see my point? Yes, I do. Yep. yep. So what do you say there? Because I, I, I'm, I'm holding, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to you because I know we had a good conversation yeah. in the back. So how do you thread that needle of, there is a role for the nonprofit, but the reality is if the design of oppression doesn't change, where do we go? I agree with you. I, I think there's no coincidence. The reason why we're tackling these issues today is not by decisions that we made just yesterday. This was in many ways by design. Laws that happened in the 1920s, you know, even the tactics that the police department has used, uh, which to me are in many cases uh, didn't change for 70 mm -hmm. years almost. Um, I think about the, the war on drugs. I think about you know, this youth predator, right, from the Clinton administration. All these policies that really got us to where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we cannot just simply provide direct service and kind of think that we're going to solve all these issues. That's, that's not how it's going to work. We have to be very thoughtful about how are we th leveraging research, how are we leveraging pr as practices, how are we engaging the community in that process as well. And at the end of the day, uh, we have to think about how, do we, how are we tackling as a, as a community, as the folks in this room, and I think about all the social capital that's in this room, how do we challenge our elected officials, government, um, our current you know, political administration that we have right now to be more thoughtful uh, about the current situations that we're in right now and really start thinking about what are the strategy and what needs to change in order so that our communities are not necessarily segregated and so that opportunity and access doesn't look different based on the zip code that you're born into. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was born in a 60623 neighborhood. I'm raising my little girls in the 60526 neighborhood. My little, girl, my little girls, five little girls that I have mm -hmm. are going to go to one of the best high schools in our state. Mm -hmm. And I wish that that level of access, the people that I'm serving, that they had the same level of access. Mm -hmm. So how do we change those structures? And I think that the people in this room, uh, when I think about some of the familiar faces that I see here, like, they have the answers. 
what needs to happen is to be on the same page, you know, and think about the strategy that really challenges those systems. Mm -hmm. And Eddie, what would you say? Because, you know, we say things like community transformation and we all nod our head and we get excited about the hope that is embodied in those words. But I often find that we don't want to fight that hard to make it happen. <laughs> And then you hear people say, well, there's an inside game and an outside game, and I agree with all that. If you were to give us some advice on what are some radical ways in which you can do something on the inside that yeah. would be transformative, and what are some of those radical ways you could be on the outside and do something that would be transformative, what would you share with us? Well, I think the first thing that I want to encourage people, right, is that I've been very fortunate to be invited to the lives of many people during a time where they're struggling with grief and suffering mm -hmm. and misfortunes. And I, I look at my work like it's God's work. Mm -hmm. So I'm a person of faith. I believe in Christ. And I believe don't, things don't just happen for the sake of happening. And so I think about how do I take those stories and inform people who don't have the access into these communities? And how do I provide access and an opportunity, a road path, so to speak, for people come out, to come out to these neighborhoods, right, to come out to Inglewood, to North Lawndale, to Little Village, to Austin, and so on. And at the same time, how do we get folks from these neighborhoods to come out to these kind of settings here too? Um, and it's, again, at the end of the day, it's about providing that access. And it's really important that I mention that because, you know, Brian Stevenson puts it best. We need to build proximity with one another. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to see the, the, you know, the, the folks who are suffering, the folks that we're trying to advocate and lift up. Um, and, and sometimes those folks are hard to find. Now, I think to your question is that, you know, as a father of, of five, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but mm -hmm. I know that I sacrifice quite a bit with my, by exposing my own personal life out there because I see the consequences of what my kids are going to have to grapple with as they get older, as they get excluded from their social friends because their father is a convicted felon as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think about that. And I think about what, is, what, what are we willing to sacrifice here? Um, and I'm not saying that we have to sacrifice our families or your reputation or any of that stuff. But I think a lot of times, you know, I have family who, I'm going to put my own political views out there, who voted for our current president. And you should see our dinner conversations sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, they're extreme, you know, um, with a lot of tension. But tension is good because you want to have that tension to be able to inform somebody and to actually learn that from that other person's perspective. And I think that that's another space that we need to continue to, you know, you know, assess and figure out, like, how do we actually have a more bipartisan approach to the work that we're doing, right? Uh, for the conservatives and for the liberals, like, we need more of that space. And I think that could happen for either side. But again, I, I think at the end of the day, the people in this room, uh, when I think about the social capital that you bring, when I think about the talents that you actually have, the networks that you have, you know, are we really maximizing that? Are we really leveraging those resources, right, to really make change? Are we informing our own family? Are we pushing our own staff, right? Um, and, and I can't help but to think about CBT because, mm -hmm. you know, CBT, one of the core components of it is to challenge people's belief systems. Mm -hmm. And are we challenging our own belief systems? And, and I think that's, that's part of the reason why I wanted to take this opportunity to be in this, in this conversation because I think it starts with you at the end of the day. Thank you, Eddie. You know, Upswell is a beautiful environment in that it gives us an opportunity to be exposed to a wide variety of points of view. And in your walkabout, you mentioned the word bipartisan. How do you navigate bipartisanship with real threats to, uh, where people are being hurt by folks? And we always say it's great to be in relationship with folks, but if I was hurting one of your daughters, I don't think you'd be trying to find common ground with me. Yeah, that's true. Right? That's true. So why do we bring that into our work when kids and things are being caged and yet find common ground? Yeah. How do you reconcile the need for us absolutely to try to be in relationship? But there is a point, I guess, where I'm looking for an answer, so I'm asking you. How do we say, I can get to being bipartisan when you stop the hurt? Yeah. So how do you manage that tension? Yeah. That's a great, great question. I wish I had a solid answer for mm -hmm. that. I could only tell you my perspective, right? So I have a, I come from a family who served our armed forces. And I have a brother who's a very highly decorated veteran, two tours in Iraq, mm -hmm. first during the deployment to the Iraq war. And I think about what our country, our government actually did to him. Mm -hmm. He struggles. Mm -hmm. And yet, yet I still love my country. Mm -hmm. 
And it's that tension that exists there, right? I, I think about my own family, you know, what drugs has done to my, my cousin, uh, Junior, who passed away when he was 18 years old and I was just a year into my pr prison system. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about the people who actually, you know, provided those drugs, from, mm -hmm. which I actually, to some extent, I, I know who they are, mm -hmm. you know. And then I think about the people who actually have harmed my own family, uh, people who have harmed people that I love, kids that I worked with in the past, uh, people that I've seen pass away. And sometimes, you know, Michael, I ask myself, and this is my faith now. Mm -hmm. I was like, God, if, if, if something was to happen to one of my kids, it's one thing that it's a car accident or something, it's a simple accident. But what if somebody decides to shoot my daughter because I'm driving in, in North Lawndale to visit somebody and they just get caught in a crossfire? Mm -hmm. Would I be as forgiving as I think I am? Mm -hmm. And I take so much strength and power from the mothers that I, for nine years I've had the luxury and I've been blessed to work with. These are mothers who have lost their kids to, to, to violence. Mm -hmm. And I think about how forgiving they have been. And here's the funny part, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about justice, when you ask them, these mothers, there's probably about 30 mothers, mm -hmm. um, and you ask them, what is justice to you? It's not about that person being held in prison for the rest of their lives or the death penalty. Mm -hmm. That's not the answer that I get. Mm -hmm. The answer is accountability and for that person to find healing. But how are we going to find healing in the Department of Corrections? Right. That right. doesn't exist there. Right. So we also have to think about, when we think about systems, mm -hmm. are we also creating systems where we're nurturing talent, where we're providing an opportunity for people to heal from their traumas? Um, you know, when I mentioned domestic violence in my house, that was my first exposure to violence in a, in a, in a space that I, any child should feel safe. And then my second exposure to violence was, was in school. Again, a second place that <laughs> children should feel safe. And then my third response to violence was, was in my community at 13 years old. Mm -hmm. So I think about all the folks that come from these neighborhoods and their exposure to trauma. And are we being intentional to also not only address the healing, but to create the systems, right, mm -hmm. that would actually prevent these situations from happening to begin with. And I think that's a longer conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be a, a longer battle as well, that we need to put skin in the game. Well, thank you. You know, as we get ready to transition to another part of um, what's in store for today, as we all get ready to leave this wonderful gathering and go back to our own respective communities and continue to do our work, what do you want to leave on our hearts and minds about what we should do to take up the work in a way where we're more impactful? I think it's really, it's really critical for me to make this point. When I mentioned earlier about who Ray Chicago was serving, about three years ago, Superintendent Eddie Johnson mentioned that he believes that between two to 5,000 people are the drivers of violence. Well, British Chicago is focusing on that number. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned through this process is if, if you're working in a space of violence prevention, then you have to really understand that progress is not linear. And what I've learned, even with my lived experience, I have learned that I also have underestimated the needs of this population. That it's not just about jobs in some cases, that it's not just about treatment of, of mental health, but it's issues around homelessness and substance abuse. It's so many other challenges they're facing. And in many cases, it's not one or two of those things. Sometimes, and majority of the times, it's all of those things. You know, to give you a snapshot of who it is that we're serving, on average, our participants have 17 to 18 arrests. 60% of our men have done prison time. And about 60% of them have children. And I think about, there's an opportunity to really stop the cycle of violence. Mm -hmm. If we could just start tackling the issue around trauma and provide other support systems that they actually need so they could become better fathers. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, for me, it's really important for this audience to understand again that progress is not linear, that we are going to see setbacks, but you should not throw in the white, throw in your, your towel in there. It's really important for us to continue to be in that ring and continue to fight with these individuals because we as a society, uh, we have marginalized them. We have excluded them. And our current laws and policies have excluded them. And this is my last point that I'll make behind this. I, I've been very fortunate to have so many blessings in my life. Opportunity to speak in different venues, class lectures at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you name it. And it's been really amazing for me. And if I would, for those who don't know me, if I, if I never would have disclosed my background in the justice system, you would have saw me up here thinking I'm somebody very important and so on. And the truth is, like, I'm no different than most of the men that I'm working with. Except that 
you know, our society, our banks and so on, you know, we, we think about debt forgiveness, but we're not as eager, we're not as eager as to, as to forgive someone who has made, a, who's, who's created a, a mistake in their past, who's led them to prison. We're not as quick to forgive somebody who's made those kind of mistakes. And that is part of the system. And these are not by coincidence. These were by design. And it impacts most of our black and brown communities here. And so that's the, that's the one thing that I want to leave behind because I think that you have an opportunity to be involved. And if you don't know where, see me after this. I'm ready Chicago. I'm, I'm in the <laughs> back, right? So that's a selfish plug-in <laughs> right there. But thank you so much, Michael, for your time as well. Well, brother, you are important. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, brother. Thank you all.